Okay, welcome everyone. I'm gonna get started. It is 12 o'clock exactly. Let's see. I'm actually going to begin over here in Blackboard. So of course, lecture module one was due this past Sunday night. And of course it was chapter one from the textbook, the quiz, the associated quiz, the intro to syllabus quiz, and then the reading for Linux Lab one and the first discussion board. <clears throat> and I saw that there are still a few people that did not post to the discussion board. Note, I will grant an exception today and today only for late discussion board posts in that first discussion board. But moving forward, I cannot do that. The reason being is no student is going back to read your posts in lecture module one that we finished last Sunday. The purpose of the discussion boards is to network, to collaborate, to learn to communicate in this environment, among other things, of course. So I cannot accept late discussion board posts. They'll be given a zero. So if you have not posted to discussion board one, you have a grace period for today, but after today, it will be a zero. And then moving forward, if you don't meet the discussion board deadlines, again, the Deadline is Sunday nights at 9 p.m. I have to um, ascribe a zero. So, so please recognize that. I'm gonna jump real quick to the lecture modules and just go over lecture module two. And I'm not gonna do this moving forward. I detailed what is, what, what is required several times in emails. It's in the announcements, but I'll do this for lecture module two, just so we're all on the same page. So again, up top in lecture module two, you'll see the directions. And the lecture modules now are, are very straightforward. Read the associated chapter. Again, lecture module two is chapter two from the textbook and take the quiz. Again, the quiz is timed. You get one attempt. Do not hit the back button. Do not you know, open a new windows, things like this. Let's see, um, there are two Linux labs associated with Lecture module two. So the first LL2A is getting your access to the Academix server set up. And the, the LL2B, we actually in earnest really begin working with the command line interface. And again, I'll refer to that because it, there are equivalent terms for it as the shell or the terminal. So I may use different terms for it moving into the future. Okay, so that is Blackboard lecture module two. Going back to CISS100.com. So of course, lecture module two, which we're on right now, has the main page. I highly recommend you watch this video. It is a really nice high level presentation and abstraction. R recall from last week, computer science is the study and abstraction and we do it naturally, we do it necessarily. So again, we look at things at the high level without the details definition of abstraction. And then down the road, we're going to increasingly look at these components, these elements in more and more detail. So I do recommend you look at, watch this. It really provides a nice framing picture. I'm going to come back to other components of this first page as necessary in my presentation in just a minute. But I also wanted to alert you to the submenu system from lecture module two. Again, this is revealed just by rolling over a mouse rollover, another term, the LM2 menu item. And you'll see computer numbering systems, symbolic representation and coding, the fetch execute cycle. This is a simulation that I'll actually perform, mobile computing architecture, and then emergent hardware. It's really these first three things that you need to focus on. And I'm going to send out an email um, just reiterating reiterating that. Okay, so that is lecture module two. And now I'm going to jump into the textbook material from chapter two. Okay, so last week we covered, we recognized that our world is analog if we look around. But the computer, specifically the von Neumann architecture, is based on digital representations. Why is that? Because when we design these computers, they're actually built with capacitors, and they can be in one or two states. They can either hold a charge or not hold a charge. And we can attribute these 
zero and one. We can also associate truth or false to this two state system that we have. Okay, so that is the nature of the computer. So we have, again, the analog real world, and we need to map it, represent it within the computer. And we have this base system. We can only use zeros and ones. So it's gonna be relatively straightforward for mathematics, numbers, things of this nature. We can create codes for text characters, but then we're also gonna need something for the symbolic representation of objects in our world, audio, video, and that's what we're gonna look at in, in greater detail today. So digital computers can only understand two states, on or off, and to these two states, we can associate either a zero and a one or a truth and a false, okay? Again, two states. This is really the nature of the binary numbering system. But let's, let's provide some more definitions here. The bit is the smallest unit of data. So it is a single zero or one. Bit is short for binary digit. And of course we know what decimal digits are, okay? So binary, of course, two states, zero and one. Sorry for repeating myself here. The byte is eight bits. We group eight bits into a byte because we're gonna learn that it really isn't realizable to associate addresses with every bit. We have to group them. So eight bits to a byte. But beyond this, the textbook really doesn't dwell on this or, or illustrate it well. Bits are denoted with a lowercase b. Bytes are denoted with an uppercase b. And this again alerts us to this detailed, precise nature of computer science. We really have to read discriminately. As an example, networking speeds. You'll see networking speeds, you know, say from Time Warner, you know, 100 MB slash S, lowercase b, megabits per second. Whereas when we look at file sizes, what are we talking about? Megabytes. And I could easily ask a tri trick question or just you know, to test knowledge, how long will it take to transfer a one megabyte file over a one megabit connection? Well, of course, they're eight bits to a byte, so it's going to take eight seconds, okay? So one megabyte file has eight million bits. I'm using the prefix mega, meaning million, and we'll introduce that in just a minute. Some other things about the byte. Okay, so memory is comprised of bytes. Every byte has both contents, okay, the usable data, and address. We get to the contents using the address, okay? So it is byte addressable. Memory is byte addressable. We're gonna learn storage is different. And I just used another new term, storage. And recall last week, I stated, you know, that the common person on the street will read computer science, a computer science textbook, and they think they will know what's going on. But if they don't understand the distinction between memory and storage, they really don't, okay? This is what we need to learn to do. We need to learn with this just distinct precision, understanding every term. So ho hopefully this is the case moving forward. Okay, so a byte is eight bits. Very, very small, actually, unit. We need a way to communicate real, realizable what we're actually using today. So we use prefixes, okay? And these should, of course, be standard from, you know, the metric system. Kilo meaning a thousand, mega meaning a million, giga meaning a billion, tera meaning a trillion. And then moving on, really, you know, when we move into the data centers, we will be dealing with petabytes, exabytes, zettabytes, yottabytes, just extreme, an extreme amount of information. Okay, so again, we need to represent our world symbolically in the computer. As a basis, we need to encode things using the binary numbering system. Why? Because we only have two states, zeros and ones. Okay, we're very familiar with the decimal numbering system. So recall what I just said about CISS100.com. There was a resource here, I'm back in CISS100.com, 
in lecture module two, computer numbering systems. I'll actually click on this. Okay. I have developed several tutorials because the textbook really doesn't go in sufficient amount of detail. They don't ask you to do this translation process enough, and we need to become very familiar with it. If you're going to networking, you need to become extremely familiar with it. Okay, so there is a tutorial here based on these sheets, and I did create a video as well. So please, I will send out this email. Please do this within the next couple of days. Perform, perform these tutorials, and also, if necessary, watch the video. You can perform the tutorials while watching the video. That's fine. We just need to become very familiar with the binary numbering system. It's the basis of everything we do, okay? Quite often, we don't really think about it, okay? Again, there's that abstraction at play, but we need to understand it. So moving back to the textbooks presentation of the binary numbering system, let's take a look. So up top, we have the decimal numbering system. We have a number, 7,216, okay? And we know that, you know, it's seven times 1,000 plus two times 100 plus one times 10 plus six times one. And I just did something there that really, we really shouldn't do, okay? I read it and thought about it from left to right. That's the way we read. But if you think about the way we were taught mathematics, we go right to left. Right, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, and on until we get to nine, nine plus one is 10. But we write and see, I even took that shortcut. Nine plus one is zero, I carried the one, I moved left to right. This is one of the problems that students have when learning the binary numbering system. We've become so adept at what we do, our brains just take shortcuts. When learning binary, force yourself back into the proper right to left analysis. So really this is six times one plus one times 10 plus two times 100 plus seven times 1000. And what is that? What is that algorithm, that process I just used? Well, I have the positional value, placeholder, however you wanna call it, times the positional value. So it's actually the placeholder times the positional value. So I know that in the decimal numbering system, 10 to the zero is the ones place. 10 to the first is the tens place. 10 squared, of course, is 100. 10 to the cubed is 1,000. Moving to the binary numbering system, what do I have? Well, the same thing, except now the base is two. Two to the zero, two to the first, two squared, two cubed. I know that two to the zero is the ones place. Two to the first is identity, right? The twos place. Two squared is four, two cubed is eight. And really typically in, in computing, when we're teaching this or dealing with anything in computer science, we pad things out to the byte level. And we know that a byte is eight bits. So if I look at the positional value of the byte, it's the ones place, the twos place, the fours, the eights, the sixteens, the thirty second the 64 and the 128s. So if I look at this value, again, moving left to right, what do I have? 1001 binary is one times one plus zero times two plus zero times four plus one times eight. So of course one plus, one plus eight is nine. And the binary makes it very straightforward because I know if it's a zero, I don't even need to think about it. I really just add up the positional values. And that is in the tutorial. So again, please perform that tutorial. Okay, so we know we can convert decimal that we're used to working with, okay, into binary, great. But we also need to symbolically represent, say the characters of the keyboard. Okay, so, what was first developed was ASCII and EBCDIC. Now, I have never used this, okay? It's esoteric, it's out there. It's, you know, was used on some systems. I won't even go into that. You should recognize that ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, 
was used ubiquitously around the world. But it had major shortcomings. Why? An ASCII character was stored in a single byte. And we know what byte is eight bits. Okay. So if I look at eight bits in a byte, the smallest number I can represent is zero. And that's what we use in computer science, okay? Computer architecture, computer engineering, zero. We begin counting at zero. We waste nothing. If I started counting at one, I have that memory location of zero and address, I never actually used it. We don't do that. Zero based address and we always begin counting at zero. Okay, so if I have a byte, the lowest number I can represent is zero. The largest number I can represent in a byte is 255. How did I get this? This is in that tutorial, by the way. If I have a one in every position in a byte, if you add up one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128, you're going to come to arrive at 255. So in a single byte, I can represent the values between zero and 255. And this gives me 256 distinct representations, right? If I were to count zero, one, two, three, four, okay, you can see where I'm going. The range is zero to 255, but that gives me 256 distinct representations. 256 distinct representations is fine for the English keyboard here. I can assign a code to lowercase a through z, uppercase a through z, so what am I up to now, 52. All the numbers, okay, add another 10. All the functions, keys, the key combinations, you know, control, alt, delete. I can assign a, a unique or distinct ASCII code to all of these. So that is ASCII, okay? ASCII is encoded a character per byte, okay? Now, obviously we've kind of moved beyond that because we have languages, uh, character sets that extend beyond English, okay? And we always want that true universal character set. So Unicode was developed, okay? With Unicode, now a single character, whether it's an English character, a Hebrew character, a Chinese character, is now assigned a unique code because with 32 bits, four bytes, right? Eight bits to a byte, 32 bits, I now have the ability to uniquely represent four billion characters. So this allows me to encode or have a unique code for ev essentially every character that exists on the planet. So again, in the beginning, we used ASCII, which is fine for English, it's great, but it couldn't even cover the entire Hebrew or Greek alphabet, okay? So the world, we moved to Unicode. And typically what we have now you know, it says eight to 32 bits. Eight, by the way, would be legacy back to ASCII. If you look at the first, you know, 256 representations in Unicode, it's going to correspond to ASCII. So there's that legacy application. Moving on. So I can now encode numbers, binary number system. I can encode characters, ASCII and now really Unicode. But we have other types of data. We have graphics data, <clears throat> pardon me. We have, of course, audio. And then later on, we're gonna see symbolic representation actually of objects. But that's really moving on into programming languages. Okay, so we'll defer our discussion on those for a while. So there are two different types of graphics data. The textbook only presents bit mapped or roster graphics. There is a whole other environment based on vector graphics. And as soon as I say this, everyone's ears perk up. Vector graphics, of course, is, well, it's object oriented in nature, but it's the basis of game design. Okay, so let's look at uh, roster or bit mapped graphics first. So what is a bit mapped image? 
essentially this is what occurs when you take a picture with your phone, scan a document on a scanner, something like this. Okay, so the scanner will break up whatever it's looking at into a grid, okay, a graph. And it will sample each cell. So this is just straightforward. This is just black and white, okay? White is one, black is zero. <clears throat> and we can see this representation. This is not going to take up much space. I can increase, you know, I guess, I don't know what the best term is, clarity, um, by representing, pardon me, by representing each cell with a byte, okay? Because now I can represent grayscale. It's not just straight white and black, but now various shades of gray. And I can see what happens now quickly with the storage requirement. <laughs> if I look at this, what do we have? You know, it's an eight by eight grid, okay? So that's a byte, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes, five bytes, et cetera, six bytes. So in black and white, this took up six bytes. As soon as I go to grayscale, where each cell is a byte itself, times eight, 64, times another eight, you can see that it's taking up much more or requires much more storage, or we're always thinking about transmission too, much more bandwidth. Okay, so we do see, you know, black and white images, grayscale, but really we like color, don't we? <clears throat> so what we see as an industry standard is the RBG, red, blue, green. So now when we sample a cell, we're going to have its red component, its green component, and its blue component. And you've seen this, you know, if you ever go order paint in, you know, Home Depot, you're going to see them add the RBG colors. And they also use white and, white and black too. But, <clears throat> and I can now see the storage requirement is going up, multiplied by another three, right? Each cell now requires three bytes of storage or requires three bytes when we transmit it. So we can see what's happening as this becomes a better and better picture, at least for us, is that the storage requirements or the transmission requirements are rapidly increasing. Now we know that our RBG in three bytes, we know that there are eight bits to a byte. If I multiply, of course, that three by eight, <clears throat> I have 24 bit color. You've probably seen this as well. And sometimes you'll see 32 bit color, which means they're adding another byte. How is this happening? Well, with an extra byte, you can actually add, say, surface properties. You know, a, a car, a picture of a car in the rain, it actually shines or reflects, or it's rather opaque, or, you know, is, is not shiny. So this is where the 32-bit color is coming. I'm losing my voice, pardon me. <clears throat> okay. So now, one of the shortcomings of graphics data in the, in the bitmapped or roster representation is it doesn't scale well. Moving back to this picture, what if I wanted to blow this picture up? I want to double its size. If I wanted to double its size, of course, this is what, eight by eight, it's actually going to be 16 by 16. Every cell will become four cells, right? In the vertical and horizontal component. So you can see it's gonna to start to look more and more jagged. And this, the, the textbook actually has a very good picture of that, is that you, uh, and, and you've seen this too on your phones, you take a picture, although, the cameras and phones today are phenomenal. So you're seeing this less and less. If you have an older phone and you took a picture and blew it up, you'd see the edges would become jagged, okay? Pixelated is what we call them. Okay, so that is an image. And I didn't really speak there about vector graphics. Um, again, it's not in the textbook. So at this juncture, you're not responsible for it, but you should know about it, okay? What is a mathematical vector? A mathematical vector, of course, is an origin, right? A direction and a magnitude. And I can see when I take that vector <clears throat> and double its size, 
I lose nothing. Vector graphics scale very well, okay, with the same amount of precision. I did include, going back to CISS100.com, oh, this tab, okay, if you look at symbolic representation and coding, I'll click on it, why not, okay, I actually included probably the best YouTube videos I could find at the time of roster and vector graphics. And I mentioned vector graphics are what's used in game design. Again, what is a vector? Origin, a direction, right? And a magnitude. So if you look at say an object in a game, you know, say I'm a player, okay? My forearm can be a vector, right? And I can just by changing the angle, the direction, it can move. You can't do this with a roster or, or bitmapped image, right? It's just essentially there's no information there. We call that information hierarchy. We try to push data up to information, try to give it context. And that's what vector graphics allow us to do. Okay, so what about audio data? <clears throat> okay. If I look at audio data, of course, there's another component to it, time, right? Because audio changes and we're looking at a wave. So we hopefully probably have some musicians out there who are very familiar with this because with MP3s, we always hear about that bit rate. What is a bit rate? Well, of course that's the time component. So how do we sample audio? Well, we have a bit depth, okay? Where does this wave appear at a certain point in time and how often do we sample it? And if I have a low bit depth and not a good sample rate, I'm gonna lose a lot because where does this line cross? Well, it crosses there, okay? The next one, you know, hopefully I'm corresponding, crosses there. And if I see my resultant form here, <clears throat> It doesn't really resemble that, does it? There's a lot of error. This is why really low quality MP3s, they don't sound real good. But if I increase the bit depth, so I'm using more bits, right, on the horizontal plane to capture where this crosses at a particular sample time, I can see I get better and better. Now in this example, this picture, it says there's no error in this one there will always be error, okay? Um, <clears throat> always be error in a digital uh, representation of audio. Whether our ears will be able to detect it or not, you know, that's, that's debatable. Um, I'm a saxophonist, I record. At a certain level, you know, 256, my bit rate, 256, um, I think it's megabits or kilobits per second, kilobits, I believe. Um, I can't tell the difference. <clears throat> so it's really up to its user perception. <clears throat> okay, what about video data? Okay, so we have pictures. We know how we can represent them either vector-based graphics or roster graphics. Video data, of course, we're capturing the pictures over time, typically for, for motion pictures, 24 frames per second. And it gives us the perception that the images are moving. You know, you've seen the old, probably, you know, the old deck of cards that had an image that slowly moved and you thumb through it. Well, it fools us. So that allows me to introduce lossy versus lossless compression. Lossy compression. I can afford to lose, I don't even worry about it, some data with elements that involve human perception. Really, when you look at motion pictures, 24 frames per section per second, are we capturing everything? No, we're capturing 24 frames. What if something infinitesimally small occurred between the times we, we you know, captured two frames? We wouldn't even have noted it. But again, it's small enough to our eyes wouldn't have caught it anyway. Okay, maybe, depends what it was. Um, <clears throat> so we can use lossy compression whenever human perception is involved. So MP3s, MP3s are you know, compressed, AVIs for motion pictures, all of these things. 
and I won't get into it in further detail. Lossless compression. <clears throat> we can compress data. Data must be lossless. So what am I talking about? Your Microsoft Word document, you're writing a paper, right? It would not be proper for you to write a paper, compress it, uncompress it, you know, and say, oops, sorry, some of it's gone. You go to turn it in, and of course you get points marked off. Or a database. You know, I have this database, but it's huge. I need to compress it so that I can store it effectively. It's not acceptable to uncompress and go, oops, sorry, we got rid of those fields, okay? Lossy compression we can use when human perception is involved. Lossless compression is used whenever data is involved. So that is not in the textbook. You are responsible for that. Okay, so we can represent numbers. We can represent text. We can represent audio. We can digitize it. We can represent pictures, okay, either roster or vector graphics. And of course, if we can represent a picture, we can represent video, right? It's just adding a time-based, a temporal component to pictures. We have data. I just described data. But we also have programs, programs, algorithms, okay, executable um, instructions. So we need a mechanism to allow us to execute programs. Recall what is the basic model of computation of computers, input processing output. It's that processing component that is that executable algorithm. I'm going to introduce another distinction here, by the way. I'm using the word process, but we also know about programs. <clears throat> What's the difference? And there is a difference. Again, this is the nature learning how to read computer science. Words that we're very familiar with, process and program. What's the difference? To the person walking down the street, nothing. There is a very distinct difference. A process is an active entity. Another word for active is dynamic, which means it's being executed. If it's being executed, it's in memory. Programs are static. They're stored in storage, the hard drive. When you have an icon on your desktop, you know, Microsoft Word icon, it's just sitting there <clears throat> on your storage. When you double click it, the program is loaded into memory and then you can begin to execute it. It became a process. A process has resources allocated to it, right? The program, when it comes in, when the program is sitting on disk, it doesn't have any memory, doesn't have any printer allocated to it, doesn't have any CPU cycles allocated to it, nothing. It's just a static program. You install a program. When I install a program, what happens? It gets stored on my hard drive. When I execute that program, it gets brought into memory. Resources get allocated to it. It gets memory, gets CPU cycles, maybe gets a printer, maybe gets an internet connection, all of these things. It's an active entity. So what did I just describe there? A process is active, or in other words, dynamic. A program sitting on storage is static. And I don't know if you caught this. I said something else there that's, that's vital to, to our understandings. Items data must be in memory to be executed upon. They have to be in memory. What, let me give you an example. If I have a database out of my hard drive, and I want to change a field, right? I want to change a piece of data. <clears throat> I cannot go out to the hard drive and just change it there. I have to read it into memory, change it, and then write it back out. And I can step back even further. I couldn't have even noted that I needed to change it unless it was already in memory for the computer to actually look at it, to know what is there, okay? And we'll see that when we cover storage, we're going to see that storage is not byte addressable. Recall every byte in memory has both contents and an address. 
a byte is eight bits, and then it has this address. The address is actually longer than the, the byte itself, because really we're looking at 32-bit systems and 64-bit systems this, our, in our present computing environment. When we look at the hard drive, we're actually going to see that it's sector addressable. We'll look at that in the chapter on, on storage. So every machine has an architecture. When I speak about the machine's architecture, it is their machine language, which is the permissible instructions, the instructions it recognizes. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, etc. We're going to look at this. I'm going to show you a simulation um, I developed. And we'll take a look at this at the discrete level. Although in lecture module two, right, on CSS100.com, you actually see it on a very high level in that first video on the von Neumann architecture. So again, please watch that video. Okay, as I presented last week, machine lang or languages, programming languages, evolved over time too. Machine language to assembly language to high level language, et cetera. But machine language is that binary based language. So essentially you create a code. The machine architecture has a code. So if it wants, if you need to add something, the machine language instruction may be, and I'm just making this up, 01101010, whatever, okay? There'll be a table. For this instruction, here's the machine language instruction, okay, in binary. So to subtract, it is this machine level instruction. And you're gonna see that in the demonstration. It will become more clear. <clears throat> now, I'll cover this later. So let's start taking a look at the system itself. Now, the textbook presents this in a very desktop-centric manner, okay, looking at, you know, a desktop tower, say, computer. We've evolved. We know this. We know that computing really has evolved to a mobile architecture. You know, people are using their phones more and more, tablets, small notebook computers. So fewer and fewer system units are actually being built or seen by the public. <clears throat> the people still using these really a lot would be your gamers. And I imagine we have some in, in class and I bet every, it happens every semester. We've had, we have some gamers who've built their own computers, which is wonderful. It is, it is a phenomenal learning experience. Um, so hopefully down the road, people can share this um, with us too. We have a discussion board coming up, which is, which is primed for this type of discussion, building your own computer. So keep that in mind for anyone who's built a computer. So the system unit um, houses, of course, the CPU, the motherboard, the, the power sources, the, the fans, etc. So this is direct from the textbook. Again, very desktop centric, you know, um, You'll see less, you really don't see this, of course, in a notebook computer, it's not as open. So let's see, a few things. We see the central processing unit, CPU, power supplies, fans, okay. Um, heat is the enemy of computing. And we're gonna look at mobile computing. And mobile computing has its challenges. Right, it's, it's, it has constrained input and output, really small screen, right? You have to type with your thumbs, whatever. But also power and, you know, when it goes along with power, heat, heat dissipation, and then of course, connectivity. And we'll look at mobile computing down the road. A few things to note, okay? Ports. Ports are presented as an outside interface to the computer whereas slots are internal to the computer. So we see expansion slots here and memory slots, okay? There is a difference, okay? Again, don't confuse a slot with a port. And you can remember this pretty easily, you know, USB port, HDMI port, okay? So, so for audio and video. So external to the computer ports, internal slots. Motherboard. Motherboard is that circuit board, okay, that essentially everything attaches to. It provides the interconnections. Okay? And I won't really go into chipsets and things of this nature. Again, those of you who've built a computer know about it. <clears throat> My advice if you're building a computer 
is get the fastest front side buses, okay, that you can afford. Other things you can upgrade. Upgrading your motherboard, you might as well just build a whole new computer. Why are the buses so important? It's been said, and it's true, that the limiting factor in computing today are the interconnections, okay? The speed at which we can transfer data. We're gonna see this in the memory hierarchy here real shortly. I don't know if I'll get to it today. So the motherboard provides that connecting essentially surface for the slots, for the expansion cards, for the memory slots and cards for the CPU. And we're seeing an evolution. We're seeing more and more things put onto the chip, which is great, right? The, low, the distance that data has to transfer shrinks. If everything's on the chip, it's all right there to some extent. You can see this in the new Apple M1 chip. Um, things are just moving more and more on the chip. Latencies go down, processing speeds go up. Power supplies and drive bays, I'm not gonna say much about it. Um, again, power with power is necessary, of course, um, and it generates heat. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, this was back in the 19, 1990s, a gamer wanted the fastest computer they could have. So, you know, gamers overclock their CPUs. And I'll talk about that shortly. Well, what to do about the heat? Because as you increase the frequency at which the CPU, the whole system is, is working, you're generating more heat. This gamer took their computer, put it in a bathtub and filled it with vegetable oil, which of course cooled the entire thing and he had super, super fast computer. And I recall at the time, people just making fun of him. And now we're actually seeing it. We're actually seeing computers immersed in various solutions to dissipate the heat. Um, so hopefully that person was rewarded um, financially for what they developed. Okay, processor, CPU. Again, you're, this is gonna become very clear with the presentation, with the simulation I do. The CPU will be comprised of the control unit and the arithmetic logic unit. And then there are others, graphical process, processing units, things of this nature. And again, it's not clear anymore because again, we're seeing systems on a chip, Wi-Fi, network interface cards moved onto the chip. Everything is moving onto the chip to support many things, um, mobile computing being one of them. Okay, CPU cores. Um, we've moved to multiple cores, okay? Um, so we're really talking about multiple CPUs to support essentially um, concurrent processing. So parallel processing, things of this nature. Dual core CPUs, quad core CPUs, Etc. The graphics processing unit, okay? It makes sense to have a separate GPU to, I should have used past tense. It made sense to have a separate GPU. Um, Apple even came out with an external GPU that connects through a port. Um, so it can offload and do this work very well. Um, but again, we're seeing some systems just to shoo and get rid of the GPU and create just a better CPU to do that as well. Okay, processing speed, I'm running out of time here. Um, typically now, our present systems, we're looking at gigahertz, billions of cycles per second, okay? Um, or we can look at the effective work that's being done, the number of instructions, because just because we have say a one billion, you know, a one gigahertz machine, does not mean we can execute 1 billion instructions per second. Certain instructions have incurred or induced wait states, latencies. Um, so the effective computation will be less. Word size, when we talk about word size, we're talking about the architecture of the computer. And again, we've largely moved to 64-bit computing. Even our phones are up to 64-bit computing. 64-bit, of course, is eight bytes in contrast to the former, the 32-bit, which is four bytes long. This is very important. And again, the, the general person on the street doesn't understand this. If you look at older systems, 32-bit systems, you, know, you possibly could have had two to the 32 
different representations. That's the number of addresses you could support. Recall every byte in memory has both an address and contents. To get to the contents, you have to use the address. If you only have 32 bits for the address, the word size, you only have 4 billion addresses. With a 32-bit machine, it doesn't make sense to have over 4 gigabytes of RAM, 4 billion um, addresses. Can't do it. As soon as you double that and go to 64-bit, then you can exceed that 4 gigabyte RAM threshold. Recall, every byte in memory has contents in an address. And it's the address that is used to retrieve or store those contents. So the bus is that electronic path. If I were to scroll back up to that picture of the system unit, you'll see little etchings. Or if you've ever looked inside a computer, you see the little etchings. So you'll see the buses. Um, and again, the word size has a dramatic correlation with the overall speed of the machine. <clears throat> so if we look, I'll scroll ahead here, an 8-bit bus versus a 16-bit bus, you can see you know, you're tra transmitting 8 bits every clock cycle, 16, you're essentially doubling it. So when you look at a 32-bit versus a 64-bit machine, you essentially have you're contrasting a four-lane highway with an eight-lane highway. And we know with the eight-lane highway, I can transfer twice as much in the same amount of time. Okay, so the bandwidth, or the formal definition of bandwidth is the amount of data that can be transferred in a given period. So throughput is the actual transfer, okay? So essentially bandwidth is theoretical. Throughput is actual. Okay. Again, terms that we see every day in our world, but if we don't know the distinction, okay, which is critically important, we're not getting the proper foundation. So again, a lot of what we do when we're learning to, you know, about computer science is learning these definitions matter. Okay, because really it is the foundation of our understanding. Okay, so the various buses, we know about expansion buses, okay, to connect CPU to peripherals, memory buses, CPU to RAM, front side bus, which is the chipset. I won't really go into PCI and USB. And I don't have time to properly introduce this in the two minutes remaining, so I will pick up tomorrow with the memory hierarchy. Um, so again, for tonight, okay, please, oh, sorry, CISS100.com, please read over the lecture module two, I'm not there, I'll get back there, okay, system architecture and processing. I highly recommend you watch this video, okay. Um, Read through here. This I'll be presenting tomorrow. If you want to omit it for tonight, that's fine. Um, and then in the sub menu, if nothing else, take a look at the computer numbering systems. Um, that's all I have for today. If you have any questions, I'll now expand the chat and see what see what came in. Um, show how to get to the discussion board. And we have some people that built their computers. Yes. So real quick. The discussion board. Um, discussion board instructions are here, okay? They're on CISS100.com. So what you should be writing or what you may want to write for your classmate introductions. The discussion board, again, and I introduced this, it's in the announcements, it's in my emails that I've sent out. Um, so I go back to lecture modules. Lecture module one, which was due this past Sunday night, down here, here are all the instructions. You should be reading this. Okay. Um, DB1, classmate introductions. I'll click on it and I will create a thread. Okay. And there's the way to enter your first discussion.